And uh, we all know that the precise performance is the key of the successful clinical examination. Therefore, understanding of these basic uh, principles and uh, much more important uh, with the later use tips and tricks are uh, really important uh, for all contrast examinations. Therefore, I introduce with my pleasure and honor the past president of FSUM, uh, Christoph Dietrich. Please, the floor is yours. Dear Maya, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends of ultrasound worldwide, I'm more than happy to discuss with you tips and tricks on how to perform contrast-enhanced ultrasound. My advantage is um, to have the liberty to choose my favorite spots for that. So my disclosure. And the agenda is, uh, I will take out some of the technical aspects uh, Professor Jean-Michel Correa has already mentioned. I will also point to some important points for clinical decision making and a few other issues. It's all about bubbles. Technical aspects. So those are the requirements we saw already from Professor Koreas. And I'm living near to Swabian, which is even more than the Scottish born to save money. That means by looking to extension lines and such devices like shown here, they are not mandatory and we avoid them because they do not support us and they cost money. So this is a device we are talking about mainly in Europe, which is Sonnevue. And this is the air that I breathe. And there's one thing which is important. Never connect this part of the package directly to the gas, because it would go away. So, please connect first the fluid to the connector, as shown here. And secondly, when this has been done, connect to the while of Sonnevue. Don't do it without connecting the syringe to the connector. So, it is nicely shown here. You put in the fluid and then you get a milky fluid which will be shaken nicely, as shown in such images. And then you put out the amount you need for your daily practice. It might not be such important to tell that pancreas will be like kidney or spleen 1.2 or 2.4 ml. This is also equipment dependent. But keep in the same range for your patients and for your indications. You can improve according to your manufacturer and settings. Some tips to do it right. So best thing would be to have, to have an anti-cubital connection. We do not use extension lines. We connect the son of you directly to the catheter. And to have a practical use, you can see the flush 10 ml. 20 would be even better, but you cannot handle by your hand, so we use 10. And a rapid flush after injecting some of you will enhance the contrast enhancing 
features shown here. On the left hand, if the examiner is on the right, the flash is connected to the filter, never the son of you. And you see here that this is a practical use of the assistance on the left side of the patient. After injecting son of you, the flash is injected. And you can see here how this is done. The examiner has enough space. The assistants give the injection on the left side and it's well situated. Another view of this practical advance. Tips to avoid is if the assistant is on the same side as the examiner, the cannula should not be on the hand because there's a longer distance to the heart and to the liver and the other organs. And we do not use such an application of the contrast agent because the examination cannot be nicely done if all that things happen on the same side. So as a rule, the contralateral antecubital cannula is the best is best to perform. As you can see here, if all happens on one side, it does not work nicely. So wrong is IV cannula on the examiner side better contralateral. As already mentioned by Jean-Michel Correas, it should be larger or, or similar to 10, 20 G. Go antecubital, do not go peripheral like shown here on the hand. We do not use extension lines because it costs money and for us as shown in the previous image there is no use of the three-way stopcock. So this should never happen on the wrong side, right-handed, next to the examiner. Never put the son of you on the filter of the cannula. It happens quite often when we do contrast workshops that this will be organized in that way. But never son of you on the filter of a cannula. Do it autograd, avoiding the filter. We don't use an extension line because it has no additional value. If there are problems, you can use an ultrasound device and you can insert the cannula ultrasound guided. The European Federation of Societies for Ultrasound in Medicine and Biology has published guidelines on how to use ultrasound devices for vascular access. You can free download from the EFSOM website. Clinical decision making. The most important has been already mentioned by Professor Fabio Pascalia and by Professor Jean-Michel Correas that the liver has a dual blood supply and we can judge the enhancement in comparison to the hepatic artery and the portal vein. Here on the left side you can see the typical image of a central vascular supply in a patient with FNH and we compare the enhancement in comparison to the hepatic artery right shown here. In the portal venous phase, we judge in comparison to the surrounding portal vein branches. And the important issue is that malignant lesions or liver foreign tissue 
has no portal vein branches. So such malignant lesions enhance variably in the arterial phase but show hypo enhancement in the portal venous phase. We judge the enhancement in comparison to the surrounding liver vessels as shown and liver parenchyma in the later phases according to timing and degree. Here you can see arterial enhancement in comparison to the hepatic artery, HA, and in comparison to the portal vein, which does not show any enhancement after a few seconds after injection. The portal vein is not yet enhancing. Three seconds later, you see the enhancement of the portal vein and you see that this lesion is no more hyper-enhancing in comparison to the surrounding liver parenchyma, but hypo-enhancing. This, this means, under oncological principles, if a biopsy would change the management of the patient, this should be done. In the late phase, this portal venous enhancement or hypo-enhancement, in this case in comparison to the portal vein and in comparison to the surrounding parenchyma, is a feature of malignant infiltration in most but not all circumstances. Some inflammatory diseases might also cause hypo-enhancement in the late phase. So biopsy and histological evaluation is mandatory whenever it changes patient's management. So there's one big issue which is so different in comparison to CT and MRI, which have arterial phase pretty early and portal venous phase at about 45 seconds if we look for the literature. But the portal venous enhancement starts few seconds after the arterial phase using the strict intravascular agent Sonovu and I will show you. Here you can see nicely it is an image from 2002 during the sort of your approval study and you see that the central enhancement and we will see later on in the surrounding the portal vein right on here and as you can see down here when we restart the clip please have a look central arterial enhancement portal vein shows enhancement two or three seconds after the arterial enhancement. So the phases we evaluate are different, I contrast enhanced ultrasound, compared to CT and MRI. Few seconds after arterial enhancement, portal vein enhancement can be seen. Mechanical index. The mechanical index has been nicely explained by Professor Correas. It might affect several processes relevant to image quality and the evaluability. The points are the degree and rate of microbubble destruction. The higher the MI, the more destructive. The depth of ultrasound beam penetration, that means in deeper location, you have to increase at least quite a little bit the mechanical index. And the ability to separate signal scatters from background tissue versus those scattered by microbubbles. Since tissue scattering is linear at low amplitudes, while microbubble scattering is nonlinear at all amplitudes. Here you can see a lesion 
inject the contrast agent of you, um, FNH, and here's the portal Wayne Enhancement. And a few seconds I will play with the mechanical index. No enhancement or little enhancement in the surrounding liver parenchyma, some sort of stealing effect of this FNH. We will increase right now the gain. And you can see there's bubble destruction because if I'm moving the transducer a little bit, it shows bright signals. And when I spray over the lesion, all that bubbles have been destroyed. So take care of mechanical index to show no bubble destruction whenever possible. Only increase in deeper locations to get better penetration. Here you can see a second feature, which is a gain. The gain should be very slightly above the noise floor, as already mentioned. Here you can see an oversaturation that only part of the signal can be displayed. In this region you have only noise. Here there is the gain too low and only signals from larger vessels can be displayed, but not homogeneous from the kidney parenchyma as shown in the middle. So we discussed the mechanical index, which is a specific setting for the respective manufacturer you personal use. And look that you always get the whole signal window, not with a too low gain and not with oversaturation as shown here. By characterizing liver, focal liver lesions, we discussed that the evaluation in the portal venous later phase shows us hypoenhancing as a sign of malignant infiltration or at least as an indication to take biopsy if a histological examination will change patient's management. In focal liver lesions there are additional features which help us to characterize and this has been quite nicely showing by the previous speakers. Please allow to show three examples. Here you can see in B mode almost not to be seen a rim enhancement or ring enhancement in the arterial face. A few seconds later you can see that the whole lesion is hypoenhancing. So this is a feature of a malignant infiltration with biological activity at the border of the lesion. Benign focal liver lesions have sustained enhancement in the portal, venous and late phases and characterizes most benign solid focal liver lesions. They can be further characterized as benign. They can be further characterized by their enhancement patterns during the arterial phase. So in the portal venous later phases, they can be characterized as benign if they show iso or hyper enhancement, sustained hyper enhancement. And a central enhancement in the arterial phase is a typical sign of focal nodular hyperplasia and an initial peripheral globular or nodular enhancement is typical of hemangioma. Let's have a look to peripheral nodular contrast enhancement. You can see nicely in this patient the peripheral nodular contrast enhancement as a sign of hemangioma and you can see a sentry petal fill in over time, those two signs. 
a short command on 3D. It is nicely possible and you can see such hyper enhancing lesions like hemangioma in a 3D image today and it gives additional information but it's not routinely used right now in daily practice. But as you can see it may show additional features with respect to the surrounding liver parenchyma and it can show the thrombose central parts of this giant hemangioma. The pattern of 58 histologically proven hemangioma in oncological patients, they had a very good reason for a biopsy because this changed patient's management and the diagnosis was not known before. Show the typical features if you are interested published in hepatology. Be aware that the peripheral nodular contrast enhancement as you can see here in the arterial phase should stay hyper-enhancing. Sustained hyper-enhancement is a sign of a benign lesion. Here you can see arterial peripheral nodular contrast enhancement, but the contrast enhancement was less. It was a wash out in the portal venous phase and therefore we initiated biopsy and histological examination in this patient and it was not hemangioma, but it was hemangioendothelioma. So always rely first on the hyper enhancement in the portal venous and late phase as a sign of benign nature and then judge secondarily the arterial phase for additional characteristics characteristic like peripheral nodular contrast enhancement as a sign of hemangioma and central arterial blood supply as a sign of focal nodular hyperplasia. Here you can see a hypoechoic spot focal fatty sparing and in that lesion you can see the individual bubbles from that tiny lesion and you can see shunts in the surrounding. So we call this lesion shantimangioma. Only part of that lesion in B mode is characterized by the lesion. The shunts give arterial blood supply to the surrounding, less fat, less insulin. Therefore the surrounding of this lesion is hypoechoic in comparison to the surrounding liver parenchyma. We cannot only detect and characterize lesions, but display shunts which show us the pathophysiological explanation of the surrounding liver parenchyma due to the shunts, more oxygen derived arterial blood, less portal venous, less fat, less insulin, therefore less fat in the surrounding. So it's a focal fatty sparing in the surrounding of shunt hemangioma. The central arterial blood supply can be nicely seen here. Sometimes you might not believe that this is really central like shown here. It can be also eccentric in focal nodular hyperplasia but we miss the fourth dimension. We miss some understanding of the time curve of such enhancement. So if you look here for a black and white central arterial contrast enhancement, you can see the central arterial blood supply and this is a typical feature of focal nodular hyperplasia. No doubt about it. But today, you can also color code such enhancement. Yellow early, green thereafter, blue a 
at the end. So we can use parametric imaging, the analysis of time intensity curves for color coded analysis of the enhancement pattern as shown here. So tip and trick is if such an equip equipment supports, you can use not only a 2D or 3D, but a 4D, that means a time-dependent analyzing using color coding. Do not trust the central SCAR in FNH, because it is only existent in 70% of FNH. And this has been nicely proven by Nguyen in 305 histologically evaluated FNH. This is a central scar, only apparently existing in 70% of patients. A beautiful central scar in an FNH. A central scar indicated right on here, but this was hemangioma, peripheral nodular contrast enhancement. The larger the lesion, the more you have centrally located regressive changes in FNH, in adenoma, in hemangioma. So don't rely on the scar. As mentioned, a mass forming lesion in the liver hilum injecting contrast quite nicely the arterial blood supply, less portal venous blood, as mentioned for the chantimangioma, you have an, not only the proof that this lesion is benign in the portal venous late phase because it shows iso enhancement, but you can understand why this region is hypoechoic less portal vein branches, less insulin, less fat deposits. So we can understand in that real-time image not only the benign nature of focal fatty sparing, we can understand the physiology behind. And that's of importance for daily practice central artery shown here. The conclusion is on how to perform contrast enhanced ultrasound. It gives general advice on the use of ultrasound contrast agents. It is important for clinical decision making and it reviews technical parameters for optimal CEUS performance. And the group of presenters and many others, scientists all over the world, will publish soon a paper on how to perform contrast enhanced ultrasound. And it will discuss all that technical aspects and clinical decision making, what we have been presenting today. So I thank you very much for your attention. And dear Maya, I'm looking forward for the discussion panel for many questions, and I hope good answers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christoph. Uh, thank you for tips and tricks. And we uh, do have some piling up questions more about uh, this one. There is one specific question for you. Was that clip for malignant lesion that you showed, uh, would that be also typical for an abscess with inflammatory ring enhancement? How would yeah. you tell the difference? I love the uh, question. Um, an abscess starts from a phlegmonous um, um, inflammatory reaction and you would never see a rim with a, such a volume and a distinctive ring of this rim enhancement. So there was a significant volume around and it has a beginning and an end of that biological active zone. In an abscess, depending on the stage, you would nev never have um, from phlegmonous infiltration to that abscess uh, such kind of um, uh, rim enhancement. It would be more irregular. It would be smaller 
at the very end of abscess evolution and it would be more diffuse in the stage between phlegmonous infiltration and pure abscess thereafter. So such kind of rim enhancement is an eye catcher for metastasis or for intrahepatic cholangiocellular carcinoma, for example, also in liver cirrhosis. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, there are additional questions about time intensity curve analysis. Uh, would you think that uh, in patients uh, with uh, some uh, peripheral uh, arterial disease, would there be uh, need for time intensity curves? And also there was a specific question about pancreatic lesions. Would we use the time intensity curves? Plus, there was an additional question about specific dosage that you would recommend for pancreatic CUS. Many questions. I will start with the um, time intensity curve analysis. There's a paper on how, how to perform on the EFSOM website, and I decided not to include in my talk. But in the future, it will be more and more important because we use targeted drug treatment options. That means a GIST tumor, gastrointestinal stroma tumor metastasis, will show after two weeks no change of size, but vascularity and therefore the enhancement will change rapidly. Pretty much the same, perhaps less pronounced at the moment. In the future there will be new develop drugs, we see such tumor evaluation response for HCC, renal cell carcinoma, but also colorectal carcinoma and other diseases using anti-angiogenetic drugs. So for future, for the future time, we would need much more attention for this special feature. For the pancreas, KISS, keep it short and simple. I'm not at all interested in later phases. I only like to know if a lesion is hyper-enhancing or mm. hypo-enhancing in comparison to the surrounding pancreatic parenchyma. That means hypovascular ductal adenocarcinoma should be differentiated from ISO or hyper-enhancing differential diagnosis and this is possible in more than 90% of patients. The later stages add nice images but no real, really decision-making additional important information. The dosage. We have to split between endoscopic ultrasound and we have to split the transcutaneous approach. In endoscopic ultrasound, for the moment, we use always the whole vial because all patients will be part of evaluation studies and this should be standardized as mentioned beforehand. The more standardized you work, the better and comparable results. If you look from outside and you have a slim patient, be aware that the pancreas in the microvascularity, not in the macrovascularity, is a highly perfused organ. So you might choose for the pancreas in a small patient, a small amount of Sonoview 1.2. Since we do all our studies in a standardized protocol, we use for pancreas always 2.4 but you might get better signal noise ratio under some circumstances with even lower dosage. Okay, uh, there was uh, one more question. Is uh, time intensity curve appearances dependent on the dose that we use? Would there be difference in time intensity curves? Yeah. We have um, enhancement characteristics the peak enhancement, which rely, which is um, influenced by different factors, 
and also the gain. You have peak enhancement and you increase the gain, so you might change your curve. And we have the time dependent parts of the curve, which is from here, uh, from here to there, yeah? And they are more stable. They are independent, more independent from the dosage, from the examiner, from the gain, but to compare area under the curve between two patients at the beginning of a treatment and at the end of the treatment, it does not nicely work because there, is, there are differences in the enhancement areas of that lesion. The lesion might shrink and there are so many things which we have to evaluate in the future to standardize, to learn more, that at this point the analysis of time intensity curve is for the advanced examiner a standardized procedure, but we have to agree on which parameters have to be compared before and after treatment, um, which parameters influences the time intensity curve analysis, all many factors have a different way on how to show such dynamic contrast enhanced ultrasound using time intensity curve analysis. I love the questions, but they cannot be generally answered at this moment. I wonder, Jean-Michel, qu'est-ce que tu penses? Yeah, well, I, I totally agree with you, in fact, and I think that this question is, is very difficult to answer. Right now, we only use time intensity curves for research and not for our routine practice. Uh, thank you uh, for the comment. Uh